Hello, this is the short version of my brain friendly teaching talk. I'm going to give you some um, quick guidelines that are based in cognitive science on how you can make your didactic lectures brain friendly for your learners. By following these guidelines, you're going to be able to decrease the cognitive load to your learners, increase their attention and increase their long term learning. And these three things we want to do with every single lecture we give. These guidelines apply if you're using PowerPoint, if you're using Keynote, or you're using some other type of slide presentation software. Step one, simplify your fonts, your colors, and your background design. Here, boring is good. Slide design is like men's pants. Memorability is a really a good thing. The more readable your slides are going to be, the easier they're going to be to learn the information from them. Slides that use multiple fonts and multiple little icons and images and multiple different colors like this are very difficult to read and very difficult to learn from. Fancy fonts do not improve learning. Be boring. Standardize your font and your layout throughout so your learners don't have to keep readjusting their brains. Limit the number of colors you use. And I recommend you use sans serif fonts rather than serif fonts as they're easier to read on a screen. And remember that like in email, using all capitals is interpreted as shouting and becomes very irritating to the audience. Make sure that the contrast between the color of your font and the color of your background is very distinct. And be careful of people who are red, green, or yellow, blue colorblind if you're using those color combinations. This is obviously not a great example of good color contrast. Red against pink doesn't work well, and red against dark blue projects particularly badly on many projectors. Be very judicious in your use of animations. This particular slide had 86 different animations in it, and I'll leave it to you to decide whether you think that really helps your interpretation and understanding of this physiological process. Simple annotations such as showing an image without an arrow and then having the arrow appear can be very effective and useful in teaching. And I would recommend that you never ever need to use a slide transition. Think about the size of the font you're going to use. Think about how does it read from the back of the room? Um, can you read this when it's in 18 font? How about when it's in 12 font? You might be able to read it on the computer, but will you be able to read it from the back of the room? The fact is that most of us make our lectures about 30 centimeters away from our devices. Here's our average lecture theater. And here's where all our learners sit. Really think about how your talk is going to project. You don't want to have people having to work hard to be able to see your slides. So think about whether you want a light background versus a dark background. And some of this will depend on whether you're including images or not. If you know that you're going to be giving your talk in a very bright room, then a dark on white or dark on light background works great. But if, like many radiology presentations, you're going to be in a dark room, a dark background is much better, and much kinder on their eyes. What you really don't want to be doing is going from a light background to a dark to a light to a dark background, because that's going to make people's pupils contract and dilate, and they're going to have a headache by the end of the session. Generally speaking, medical images are going to look much better on a dark background than a light background. Take a look at this cardiac MRI on the light background compared to on a dark background. You want people's pupils to be maximally dilated to take in all the detail. While talking about images and graphs, try to put each one on a separate slide in your presentation whenever you can, realizing that sometimes you need to put two images such as pre and post contrast or uh, two or three different sequences and MRI together so that one can compare them. But most times you do not need to have eight, nine, 10 different images on one slide. This slide really needs each of these graphs to be on a separate slide. And then you can talk about each of the graph while you're moving through the presentation rather than having your listeners look at more distant graphs that you're not talking about yet. The simpler you make the graphs, even if you have to withdraw them, the more understandable they're going to be for your audience and the more memorable. Don't waste your real estate. Maximize the size of images cropping down into the area. See how much better you see the area of appendicitis in this patient. Tables are often used terribly in talks. You need to summarize them. Don't put up some huge table and then say to the audience, well, I know you can't see this. If they can't see it, don't put it up. This is not a terrible table, but it has more details needed during an abstract presentation, and it can be easily shortened. 
This contains the same information and you've not only simplified it, but you've highlighted for your learners the important figures that they need to look at. Really work to reduce the amount of text you have overall in your lectures and particularly the amount you have on any one slide. They can read faster than you can talk and you want them to focus on your talking. So just have those key points up there, not every word you're going to say. I took this slide, which was given in a presentation to our medical school here, and I looked to see how much I could shorten it and still keep the, the most important points there. And this was the final result. If you use a large font, like at least 30 signs, if not going up to 40, it's really going to limit how much text you can get on a slide and it will make you do this. Don't worry about the number of slides, worry about the amount of text. Really focus on one key learning point per slide. I don't necessarily mean one line per slide, but one learning point, and I'll give you an illustration. This is a pretty simple slide about intracranial hemorrhage, but when you start to look at it, each of these is an individual learning point, and these should be separated out so you can focus on them. So you might start about talking about mass effect on this slide, and then on this slide, start talking about how intracranial blood changes with time, and then you talk about the key features of a subdural hematoma and then the key features of an epidural hematoma. And what you're doing here is helping your learners chunk information together, which is a very important way of them learning to store information and also being able to retrieve it later. Remove anything but the most common abbreviations or acronyms in your lecture. Otherwise, it becomes very frustrating, particularly for the less experienced learners in the audience trying to decode your slides. A slide like this, for example, is really going to be a complete mystery to the medical students and the junior residents. Signal the key information on your slide to the learners. This helps with their retention of information and it decreases their cognitive load, particularly when they're note taking. So you can do this verbally by speaking a little bit louder about an important point or saying the most important thing that you need to remember is if you forget this, your patients will die. This is very likely to be in the exam. That one works quite well. Or you can do it visually. And you can do it visually on an image or on a table by just putting something in a different color or highlighting it. Whenever you can, replace text with images. I'm not just talking about medical images or um, radiographs, for example, but also visual images that will help people remember. This is using the modality effect. If we combine an image with us talking about that image, we markedly improve the uh, memorization of those facts because we're decreasing the cognitive load on our working memory. Does one need text to teach this or is this going to be a much more vivid visual representation of pyloric stenosis that will stay with the learners? And finally, practice your talk out loud several times. I practice all my talks, even the ones I've given before, out loud as you'll be much smoother and your learners will appreciate it. The full version of this talk, along with the cognitive science behind these suggestions, is available on my personal YouTube channel. Um, you can find under Petra Lewis.